Welcome, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, it's great to see you all here today. Um, this is a co-hosted X Talk and TLL speaker series on building community in remote classroom. We're thrilled to have uh, three MIT instructors with us today as our panelists. Um, I wanted you to know that we'll be using Slido to aggregate questions, and there's some um, helpful information in the chat about that. Um, and we wanted to also just invite you to minimize the use of uh, chat to the speakers or hosts so as to not create distraction. Um, our panelists today are Dr. Simona Sokrat, um, Mr. Kang Zhao, and Dr. Ari Epstein, and they'll be speaking in that order. Um, before we turn things over to the panelists, um, Dr. Deepa Shaw with the TLL um, lab is going to speak a few moments just to give us a, um, some key concepts and uh, principles behind building community in classrooms. So I'll turn it over to Deepa and then she will turn it over to our first panelist. So Deepa, take it away. Thank you, Molly. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, so just to like foreground um, what all of the great strategies and tips that you're gonna hear from um, our colleagues today. I just wanted to, to share a really very brief um, synopsis of, of some of the literature um, on what we know about how community actually can help, help students um, in learning environments. So while there are many different areas of research that point to the importance of community for learning, one that I'm gonna to highlight today is the research on sense of belonging. For college students, the sense of belonging refers to the perceived social support and connectedness and a sense of fitting into the larger college community. So this community includes the students' departmental and classroom communities as well. And that is how this topic is relevant to today's panel discussion as we hear about how our colleagues have cultivated community in their fall subjects. All students are likely to question whether or not they belong but students from underrepresented groups are particularly likely to question their belonging in higher education. In the research on sense of belonging, what you see is that an increase in a student's sense of belonging increases their motivation, their engagement, their academic achievement, and their psychological well being. Creating classroom communities is certainly more challenging at a distance when we're teaching remotely, but the research shows that it's certainly worthwhile. If you're interested in learning more about the research on sense of belonging, I encourage you to check out the TLL webpage and I'll, I'll post the link in the chat in a moment. But I'll now pass it on to the panelists, beginning with Dr. Simona Socrate. And a reminder to our panelists to try and keep your, your initial remarks to under seven minutes so that we have time to take questions from the audience. And I'm sure that we'll have many, uh, many questions. So thank you so much to our panelists for, for joining us today and sharing your experience. And Simona, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do not have a presentation for seven minutes. I have a list of points that I'm gonna make and then hopefully we can talk more if anybody's interested in the discussion part. Uh, so I'm gonna share my whole screen so that it's easy for me to navigate through things. Is that all right? Uh, there are a few points here of things that we talked about before the beginning of the semester to make sure that the students um, did not feel threatened by the uh, situation too much and they actually they uh, started the semester with some sense of uh, you know engagement and enthusiasm. So one part of um, what we were concerned, we were concerned about the stress level uh, being off campus. And so one major decision that we made just at the beginning was to uh, sub all the midterms and the final with three projects. So the uh, projects that we decided to do are projects in which the students need to write their own uh, PSAT problem. So they have to create a homework problem with the same standards as the homework problems that they, that they have seen in the class. Uh, uh, essentially based on their surroundings. So they're supposed to look around. This is a class of mechanics and structures. So they're supposed to look around themselves and try to figure out what is something in their surroundings that can be approached with the techniques that we use in the class. So in this way, we thought we would kind of bring a connection between the class and their life. And also by modeling the real life objects, uh, there is a lot of digestion of the material that the students need to do in order to do that. So we thought that would be a good exercise. And we did two projects so far. We're gonna have a total of three projects. So each midterm and the final was taken over by a project instead. And it's really impressive what the students came up with. 
I can talk more about how we structure that and um, how we supported the students. Uh, but essentially we, um, we have our whole teaching team, plus we had two specially assigned undergraduate that did really well in the class in previous semester to function as the project mentors. And that also helps students connect to the upperclassmen, which is really important for a community of students at South Campus. Uh, so I should say that 2001, these are sophomores. So it's the first year in mechanical engineering. So they do not have yet a mechanical engineering community to work with. And so we were worried about the fact that they had to all of a sudden work with people that they did not know. And they had not yet created those links that they normally create in this first class in mechanical engineering. So one way to get them to work together is we organize, we do discovery labs in 2001 in which they, uh, they're supposed to rediscover uh, some important notions in mechanics by themselves. It's like, it's a kind of a sense of, a sense of, uh, uh, sense of wonder that comes with figuring something out on your, on your own and then it stays with you. So normally we do this in a, in a lab setting at MIT. And this time, because we couldn't do that, of course, uh, we, uh, created a kit of materials that went to all the students, tried to recreate this lab experience. And also that um, served as a way for them to work together with other people in the class. So they do the lab activity in groups and that helps get them to meet each other. And normally we uh, create the group. We, so we created the group at the beginning of the semester. The group gets reshuffled every month. There are ways for students to ask to be reassigned if things do not work well, no questions asked. Uh, so we try to create a way for the students to work together. And when we created the kits to send to the students, uh, we um, made sure that the uh, kits were um, not just science. I mean, there was science that we need to do the lab, but also kind of fun things like, uh, you know, pool noodles and uh, silly party. You can see these are all the things that went with their kids. So, when they received their first kit, we sent three kits. So this is the first kit. When they received the first kit, they get a sense of that we care about what we care about them and we care enough to actually put these things together. And then these kits are used um, in, the, um, in the class, as I was saying, in the lab. And we uh, managed to uh, send all the kits and get everybody in a lab group. We have 130 students, uh, 20, 125. So we managed to put them in lab groups. And the very first week, we had our first discovery lab in which they were studying axial loading. So from the very beginning, they started to work with their peers. And that, I think, was really important to kind of set the base. Um, we, I have a very good teaching team. And that was a part of the work was kind of putting this team together. It's a large team. We have four institutional instructors, I have three graduate TAs. In theory, I have four graduate TAs, but I foregone one graduate TA in exchange for undergraduate TAs, which I think are really important to create the community. I always have two TAs that are seniors and two TAs that are juniors. So, and then the two juniors this year are gonna be my two senior next year. So from every class, I draw two students that I think are really good at understanding pedagogy and, and to work as support for the new class of students. And, and then they graduate to be the senior on the graduate years next semester and so on. I also applied for funding through a ELO opportunity to have course mentors and project mentors. So as I was saying, instead of the group, uh, instead of the midterms, we do projects. And so I have two excellent undergraduate students that are project mentors to help the students work on their projects. And I have two course mentors. So these other mentors are in support of a program that we have, a mentoring program for students that are struggling in the class. And essentially what we do is we uh, invite after about a month of class, depending on where I see people having trouble. And this can be trouble on the, on the substance of the class. Sometimes it's just disconnected. The students seem disconnected or uh, they struggle in some way, we hook them up with a mentoring team. And essentially what we did is we set up a calendar. Um, let me see, we set up a calendar uh, in which they can go there and click on the slots and make, and make an appointment with their mentors. And then once they make an appointment with their mentors, 
uh, they can then decide to have a regular mentor session one hour every week. And for students that really struggle, we went up to two hours. And in the beginning, it was an individual meeting with the mentors to set them up. But then it became, uh, we created a small group of mentor students so that they get to know each other and work together, two, three people at most. Uh, but typically started individual and that transitions. Um, so we really tried to foster a growth mindset in this mentoring program. We had Lourdes that was nice enough to come and actually give a seminar on growth mindset to the entire class divided into groups. And that was remarkable. So many students were uh, giving me feedback on this it was really good. The other thing that we do is we use a lot of piazza and a lot of office hours. The piazza, for me, piazza is really important to set the tone right away to make sure that they are civil, but also be extremely responsive. So um, our team is always married on piazza. This is the average response time for this semester, 14 minutes, including nights, weekends, uh, holidays, whatever. We always answer questions on piazza which makes it so that the students don't feel all alone dealing with their problems. And as you see, the number of students that actually engage on Piazza, considering that I have 120 in the class, is quite high. So they know that this is a resource that they have and they ask, they ask questions. They can ask private questions. They can ask uh, questions on the forum that everybody can benefit with. Uh, so that's another way for them to be connected. Um, we have Slack channels that we mainly use with the TAs. Uh, I did not add a Slack channel to the, uh, for the students because I thought that the communication through Piazza was sufficient and I did not want to have that too much spread out. But for the, for the team, we use Slack. And then uh, because one of the things that the students were missing were the ability to work together on PSAT, we set up even in PSAT parties. So the PSAT parties are essentially Zoom uh, meetings in which the students can join before host and in which there are uh, typically I have five PSAT problems so there are seven pre-assigned rooms one for each PSAT problem and then there is a, a room just to chat socialize and one room to work in peace if you then want to join the other room and they set up with a new zoom um, release that allows people to navigate between rooms and so I tell the students that the PSAT parties room are open between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. every evening and join on the hour or on the half hour so that you have more chance of finding other people together. Because if people join like at you know, 9.32 and there is nobody, they may get discouraged and leave. Instead, what I found is that if you tell them join on the half hour or join on the hour, then the people that are ready to work then, they find each other and they work together. Um, so that's it. I think I'm going over time as always, and I'm glad to talk more about all this. Of course, this takes a lot of resources, and these are all my resources for the, for the class. And some of them are normal resources that I always have, but I applied and I got four more students uh, to help me as mentors and an extra undergrad TA through the ELO program. So I'm fortunate it's a big team to manage, but we are surviving and the students are doing really well this semester. So I'm really happy about it. Thank you so much, Simona. And don't worry, you were like perfectly on time. So now we're going to ask um, Kang Zhao to tell us about um, the subject he is teaching um, this semester in global languages. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kang Zhou from Global Languages. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this chance to join the panel to discuss this topic. Today, I'm going to share some teaching practices I use in my language classes, which aim to build an embracing learning community. As a language teacher, my ultimate goal of teaching is to help students develop communicative proficiency, critical thinking skills, and cross-cultural understanding. In order to achieve all these three goals, we need to create a positive learning community in which students have substantial opportunities to communicate, interact, and engage with each other. What kind of community can be considered as a positive community? I believe every teacher has their own definition. From my perspective, a positive learning community should be safe and inclusive, which means making every student feel welcome, giving them time and space to share ideas without fear. All different voices are valued. 
supportive and collaborative. We know that learning a new language can be a great challenge. We need to create a mutually supportive learning environment, establish a shared goal, and actively promote collaborative learning. Dynamic and sustainable. Once the community has been built up, how can we <clears throat> keep it dynamic and sustainable from the very beginning to the end of the course? So now I'm going to illustrate these points respectively with examples. To build a safe and inclusive community, trust is fundamental. We need to get students and teachers to know each other very well and keep all of us connected. Instead of jumping into course content right away, I start with a few icebreaker activities. For example, all students, include myself, will post a two to three minutes self-introduction video on Padlet. Students then take this opportunity to give comments on each other's videos, such as their common personal interests, exchange their Chinese learning experiences. We can see that the interaction starts before our formal class starts. All these interactions will be very likely to build up a strong connection within the community later on. To build a supportive and collaborative learning community, I encourage students to share their learning strategies and their self-reflections during their learning. For example, Memorizing Chinese characters is not an easy task for all beginning learners. In Chinese 101, to better overcome this challenge, each student will choose two Chinese characters and share the mnemonic strategies of memorizing these characters in front of the whole class. We can see that the students are very creative. They love to share the interesting ideas and their participation create a relaxed and a warm classroom atmosphere. In my more advanced class, students are encouraged to be a collaborative learner by posting their thoughts, questions online, and responding to their class with posts. In order to increase interaction and collaboration among students, I'm trying to make adjustments to assessment, assignment, I think in remote teaching environment, the assessment of student assignments should not be the job of teacher alone. Assignments should be varied and designed to be visible, sharing with all community members. So in my class, students share their insights and understanding on Chinese culture and Chinese society by making posters. The students, they are very talented. They, drew the, they draw the pictures by themselves, producing Chinese podcasts and making digital assets such as we love. Like in this chapter, the topic is Chinese food. We learn how to describe various flavors, eating habits, food culture in different regions. Students are asked to introduce one of their favorite dishes to their classmates by completing a mini video project. So many students cook their favorite food on their own demonstrate the cooking method and explain the food culture associated with that dish. So all videos will be posted online and shared by all students. Building a positive learning community is a sustainable process rather than one-time practice to strengthen connection among students and teachers throughout the whole semester. I have made different attempts during class and off class. For each lesson, I made pre-class warm-up videos. And in these videos, I shared my personal experiences, stories, and perspectives related to the new topics introduced in our lessons. These warm-up videos turn out to be a great way to establish a strong and long-term student-to-teacher connection. Outside the classroom, I organize online Chinese table activity on a weekly basis to provide a virtual space for informal, spontaneous interaction among students. It's a theme-based language table. We discuss so many interesting topics which cannot be covered in our regular classroom, such as uh, Chinese festival, street sign culture in Hong Kong, Chinese dialect, loan words in Chinese, and popular TV drama. Last but not least, 
it's essential to build a dynamic community to increase potential involvement of people who have various back cultural backgrounds and different personal experiences. I asked my first year Chinese students to teach their families, friends, some basic knowledge of Chinese language and culture. In my advanced class to expand our learning community diversity at MIT, I launched a WeChat language partner project in the past few years. Each student will be assigned to a native speaker of Mandarin Chinese from China to communicate via WeChat. Through creating more authentic language immersion environment with native speakers, students will greatly improve their language skills, deepen their cultural awareness, and create new friendship as well. So to sum up, uh, I think building an embracing community in a virtual classroom is both a challenge and an opportunity. It does not only to help students reach their language learning goals, but also to include everyone and stay together, move forward together in this special time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of those um, visuals. They really, really help to illustrate um, all of those assignments and, and activities in which your students engaged. So last but not least, we have Dr. Ari Epstein from, from Terrascope. Um, and then after Ari um, shares, I will um, start to read out some of the questions from the Slido and, and direct them to the appropriate panelists um, and, and also um, invite additional comments from the audience. Super, so um, I have to warn everybody that my PowerPoint has been acting up. So if the screen goes black, um, I'll just hop out and hop back in again. Um, but uh, can you all see that so far? Okay, great. So um, uh, the class I'm gonna talk about is 12 triple zero, solving complex problems. And I should say we have an advantage going in, which is that this class is part of a freshman learning community. So we already have a lot of community stuff happening. Uh, over the summer, we did a lot of engagement activities, particularly this year. Uh, I can talk about any of these in detail if you'd like. Uh, we have a Discord that is uh, Terrascope wide, but it has a whole bunch of different channels. So for example, there's a channel for each GIR and uh, if people are having trouble, they can sort of go into that channel and communicate with one another, set up problem set parties, those kinds of things. We have a Terrascope room, a virtual Terrascope room. It's an open 24 hours a day Zoom room that people can go into to hang out. Uh, we give them lunch once a week, and by giving them lunch, I mean we, we reimburse them for their lunch and we gather at a set time. Uh, we also have advisors who are part of the Terrascope program. So your advising group, your advisor and the associate advisors are all part of the Terrascope community, and there are other upper level students. Um, all this stuff is coordinated by Elise Chambers, who I think is in the room now. So if you have questions about these, we can, we can haul her up to answer them too. Um, and Professor David McGee and I co-teach 12000 with um, incredibly important assistance, both from a graduate teaching assistant and from a group of undergraduate teaching fellows, students who took the class before and are now acting as, they don't really do a lot of teaching. None of us do a lot of teaching this class. I'll explain that in a sec, but they're present and really important part of the class. Uh, so I should say a little bit about the class. Um, we give the students one big problem. There's about 50 students in the class. And we say, as a class, you need to solve this problem or come up with a proposal for solving this problem. And we don't give them a lot of guidance. We give them a lot of support. So there are all kinds of supports, but we don't tell them what to do and when to do it. So ordinarily, this class involves a lot of, you know, people will be set up at different tables and different groups will gather. And sometimes they'll spontaneously mix and people go group to group to group. So it's a very community oriented class. And uh, we have that Terrascope room. So at all hours of the day, people can be found in there working together. So for us, community is incredibly important, which meant that this year was gonna be really, really challenging. So I'm gonna talk about things we're doing throughout the semester. And then I'll talk about some things we did at the very beginning and some things we did on a sort of an ad hoc basis uh, at various times in the semester. Online platforms, um, the kind of flexible uh, aggregation and re-aggregation and moving around and socializing that is part of the class we knew it was gonna be a challenge. So we hired half a dozen uh, upperclassmen to try out, uh, they tried out about three dozen different online platforms and came up with a set of recommendations. And they recommended that we uh, begin class in Zoom and that we use Discord for breakouts and for a variety of other uh, sort of flexible communication 
uh, modes, and that we use Mural as the online whiteboarding tool. And they, you know, they were testing these things specifically for the needs of this class, and I think they did a really nice job, and that was very helpful. Every student um, is well. I was every student does write us a reflection every two weeks. Every almost every student writes us a reflection every two weeks. They're all supposed to. Um, and those reflections, David and I are the ones who read those. So it's a sort of an individual thing, but they give us a really good sense of what's going on with the sense of community in the class. If there are students who are feeling alienated, we know that immediately from reading their reflections. If interesting things are happening in the community, uh, if things are happening within a group, we hear everybody in the group's separate perspective privately about what's going on in the group. So that's really helpful. And the feedback we give to them can also be a pretty important element. Another thing that's really important is the students own the class experience. After the first couple of days of class, um, it's really up to them what they want to do and how they want to run class. And so they build their own community around how they're going to run class. Do they want to have long discussions about are they going to vote on something or go for consensus? Do they want to appoint a moderator? All of these kinds of things, they're making these decisions together, which really builds a different form of community. Uh, the UTF's undergraduate teaching fellows are incredibly important. Uh, this year we've been asking them to be particularly attentive and each of them has a few students that they're looking at looking out for um, they reach out to the students they keep an eye on them for us let us know if there are things we need to do uh, in, instructors and utfs communicate so you know the the weekly staff meeting is another really important time for us to check in with the utfs about what's going on in the community as a whole um, as i said we have this the uh, the telescope room open for them to go into the Zoom, Terrascope Zoom room. We have alumni mentors, uh, quite a few alumni mentors. Uh, most of them are people who were in Terrascope. Some of them are people who were at MIT before Terrascope existed. Some of them come to class. Uh, they're available outside of class, uh, periodically do some outreach activities, which I can talk about. Um, they uh, are also available to give feedback. So the students have presented their work collectively a few times this semester. And each time, maybe 10 mentors have shown up in class and given comments afterwards. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out is that the UTF and mentor communities are individual communities in themselves, and it's really important to find ways to build and grow those. Uh, let's see if the PowerPoint works. There we go. So um, early in the semester, we had them do something, this is what we called the zeroth assignment, was everybody made a Google slide. And the assignment was to put on this slide some picture that is important to you for literal reasons, but also perhaps metaphorical reasons, and a picture that shows your face, and to leave room for other pictures we're going to ask them to add later. And then in the speaker notes at the bottom, to say a few things about the pictures. You know, what, what literally is this picture showing? And metaphorically, how does this picture reflect you in your life? All the students did it. Staff did it, teaching staff did it, UTFs did it, um, Terrascope advisors did it, alumni mentors had their own deck. So we, you know, we said, make up a slide and just throw it into this Google deck and anybody can thumb through the decks at any time. Uh, those were incredibly important. They've been really, really valuable. Another thing we did was what we called um, a jigsaw format. <clears throat> so um, for the first, I want to try and not get too much into the, the details of the class. For the first assignment, we asked them to specialize in groups of four or five that were going to study one particular topic. And before you got together with your group, we asked you to look at the who we are slides for everybody who's going to be in your group. And in your reflections, we wanted you to say something interesting about the who we are slides, just as a way of making sure they actually did it. So they worked together for a little while. And then we, we reshuffled them and said, OK, you know, members, we're going to now so there were 12 groups of four people. And we said, okay, now we're gonna make four groups of 12 people. Each one of the people in your group is gonna be a member of this group of 12 people. So all 12 groups are gonna be represented. There won't be anybody else from your group in that group. Am I making sense? Is this, okay. And you need to read the who we are slides for everybody in this jigsaw group also. So that's already, you know, 15 people that you're getting to know through their slides, whether, you know, if, and again, we had them uh, tell us about the slides and the reflections. Uh, we also, this semester, um, in the first couple of weeks, uh, we allowed students to opt out of this, and only one student did. 
uh, we randomly assigned students to alumni mentors and mentors reached out to the students to talk about anything. Uh, it could be about the class, could be about MIT, could be about anything at all. And just initiate those conversations. And then throughout the semester periodically, there've been times when we've asked students to pick a mentor to reach out to um, and continue. It could be the same mentor or a different one and continue those kinds of conversations. Don't have to have anything to do with the class. Could really be just, what was your MIT experience like? Um, one more thing I guess I'll talk about and then we'll, we'll um, go into questions. Um, we did things on an ad hoc basis as necessary. And here are a few of the things we did. So uh, right after the election, uh, we anticipated before the election that people were gonna really need some processing time. And so in the class periods immediately following, we said, in addition to everything else that's going on, we're gonna create some breakout rooms. Um, and there's gonna be one that is devoted to people who just wanna talk about the election. This is during class time, right? So you can skip out on your group and just come to one of these breakout rooms if you want. One group for people who just wanna talk about the election. One group for people who wanna talk about anything but the election. One group for people who wanna talk about anything at all, but just don't wanna be in class today. And then the ordinary class group. So that's an example of the kind of thing we've done. Uh, the UTFs have uh, created office hours, particularly around uh, assignment deadlines. Um, and that has been a really great convening mechanism. You know, if the students, a group of students show up at the UTF office hours, um, that means they're all there at the same time, you know, as, as previous speakers have talked about, creating a mechanism for students to get together at a particular time is very handy. And so there have been, those have been moments of convening outside of class time where people have really built community in a very informal way. Uh, we also, for some classes, have asked the UTFs to create breakout rooms. Well, we created breakout rooms for them and asked them to have 10 minute little icebreaker sessions within those breakout rooms before class, just to get everybody um, everybody feeling a little more relaxed and, and happier. Uh, and that was something that came out in conversations with UTFs that we were really gonna need to do something like that. And of course, a huge uh, part of the community is the group work that people do um, before the big deadlines as they come up. I'm gonna stop there. I did bring along a couple of examples of the Who We Are slides, if it turns out that that's relevant. Um, but I should stop now because I'm sure there's a lot of really great questions out there. Thanks so much uh, for your time and attention. Thank you, Ari. Um, and we do have a lot of great questions. So um, for some questions, I'll direct them to um, a particular panelist. Um, but then if um, others have, have a, a quick tidbit to add, feel free to unmute um, and go ahead and add. So our first question popped up on the screen while um, Simona was speaking, but Ari, you also have a mentoring program. So you might have something to add after Simona goes, but Simona, I think this question was uh, originally directed to you. How did you ensure that mentors have the skills they need? Do you have training in advance? Um, yeah, I mean, there are, first of all, I choose the mentor based on how they did in the class. So these are alumni that already took the class before. And also we have resources to train the mentors. So in the, let me share this. So in the, in our Canvas site, we have resources both for the mentor students, but also we have resources for the mentors. Uh, so in the beginning of the semester, we train them in terms of what to do with their mentee, how to schedule, how to uh, have a, a mentoring session being successful, both from the point of view or their, their um, you know, the, the whole person, not just the mechanics. Oh, by the way, I was so jealous listening to you guys talk about your classes and I want to take both of your classes. My class is like, a train kind of runs you over. That's what my class is about. And in your class is all so much fun activities. <laughs> I feel like a hero if I take 10 minutes at the beginning of class just to chat. And, uh, and it's hard because with 120 students, it's hard to chat. So actually I split the 120 in two cohorts so that I only have half of them at a the time. But even like that, um, it's challenging. So I'm really jealous of all the great activities. So for the mentors, I this this mentor system kind of relies on, on materials that I already prepared. I have like a mentor camp program in 2001 in, under normal circumstances. So I already had a lot of the resources, but in terms of training the students, um, 
we do that at the beginning of the semester. We pick the right kind of students that know not only the content, but they seem to be particularly interested in being uh, tutors and mentors for, for the rest of the students. And we have uh, resources for them. Like we tell them we have Google Docs that tell them what to do for the first time they have a, a meeting with their mentee. We tell them, you know, go through study habit, figure out what is going on and what's not make a plan to catch up with the class. Um, then we have, uh, for each week, we have what activities to do with your mentee during that week. So we have specific des descriptions of the kind of problems to do for each of the week in which they are mentoring students. And we also have, um, well, we have all kinds of things, but we, for, the, for the mentee, we have a worksheet uh, that we, so normally the problem, the, the students that have issues in my class are students that have a problem figuring out path to solutions. And for these problems, we try, for these students, we try to scaffold the solution a little more carefully, like step-by-step -step solution process. So we have um, for the mentor student resources that corresponds to having uh, worksheets for uh, how to solve certain problems. So depending on what kind of uh, problems you have for each of these kind of problems, there is gonna be a worksheet that says, what are the steps to solve these kind of problems? So the mentors work with their mentee on the current subject that we are studying in class, but using all these scaffolding mechanisms that we prepare for them. So the mentors are not just thrown to the wolves, but they are supported. And uh, of course, we also um, we also try to um, uh, we also try to have a lot of people contributing to this. So it's not like I only have the it's not like I only have the two mentors that I got from the ELO. The so the everybody is involved in the mentoring program. So these are all the people that are involved in the mentoring program. I have two of them that are dedicated just to be mentors, but I have all the TAs in the class that also serve as mentors and they do special hours for their mentee. Um, so that's how we run it. I'm not sure if I answered the questions enough. Thank you, Simona. Ari, did you um, wanna just offer um, a one or two minute synopsis of how you approach training your your mentors sure if um, you it's really easy to, to be quick because we don't actually train them um in our case it's a very different thing it's it's very self-selected basically if you're an alum and you'd like to be an alumni mentor for us we kind of would like you to be there i think it sometimes happens that mentors realize it's not really for them and they kind of drop off um i have this other great advantage going in which is i know almost everyone who's taken terrascope in the past so if there's someone who I think is gonna be problematic, I'll at least know that. Um, I have to say that tends not to happen. The people who would be bad at being mentors generally don't wanna be mentors. And really this is, you know, in our case, there's less subject content. It's really all about process. And anybody who's been through MIT has spent a whole lot of time having either successful or unsuccessful group projects. Um, and a lot of our mentor role is very much a social one. So really it's just about being there for the students. There's a lot more to say about that. There's sort of, that's sort of the general picture. With, in the case of certain individual mentors, it goes beyond that. And there are other sort of tasks that they do. And one of the things we rely on them for is to ask the students really hard questions certain times of the semester. But that general, I'm happy to talk in more detail, but that's sort of the general picture for us. Yeah, Thank you, Ari. That the emotional support is really an important part of the the whole need for mentoring for some of the students. They are isolated, they are live under difficult circumstances at home. And a lot of time is just a matter of coming up with plans for them to have a place to work, uh, a time to come out, to cut from their, from their schedule, and also to have a mental attitude that is um, a growth mindset about how they, how they approach um, perceived failures and how do they move on from that. And I think another thing that we share with the mentors are all the um, materials that we get from Lourdes that is our guru for that. And uh, that's been really helpful for us. Great. 
So the next question I'm going to direct to King, and um, you talked about the icebreaker activity that you have of all students posting a two or three minute video on Padlet. Um, so the question is, did all students submit a video to share and was there any resistance to that um, assignment? Yeah, I think this is a um, required part of my course. So I they have to submit the, the introduction video on the Padlet. Yeah. I, so I think every student, they submit their video. Great, thank you. Um, Simona, with regards to your piece at parties, how did you um, handle students in different time zones? Well, that's why we have the piece at parties in the, from 7 to 11 p.m. Because that's kind of like a, people that live on the East Coast, they are normally, they normally work late. And uh, it's a little early for the West Coaster, but it still works. I have a few students in very difficult time zone to, to schedule things for uh, 12 hours off. And even the students in the 12 hours off, the 7 to 11 p.m. works for them if they're willing to do some work in the morning. So I try to figure out a time window that would work for most of my students, if not for all of them, because that's almost impossible. Um, but I, I thought that I, I, in the beginning, I thought I would have two scat two to group to um, time windows for the PSAP parties, but it ended up that nobody was going to the ones in the morning. So I just closed them because it was just done at that point. The more opportunities you have, the less chance you have of having people meet there by, by chance. Uh, so you do not want to give too many opportunities because then other people would just join when nobody else joins. So I, I think it's more important to actually limit the time so that there is more chance that people find that the friends there. Sometimes now I find they give each other appointments and they have set time. So at a certain time, there's always the same group working. Uh, but in the beginning, it was by chance. So not too many options is a, is a better choice, is a better strategy. Thank you, Simona. So I have to admit that I decided to refresh Slido. And so now it's spinning on my side, but I do remember what the next up most upvoted question was, but I might not phrase it exactly how the author wrote it. So I think this question, I'm making an assumption that this question was directed to Kang, and it's um, about, um, did you find native speakers to connect your students with? Oh, that's a very good question. And that is a challenge part for me. and. Um, uh, the good thing is nowadays, either in mainland China or in Taiwan, the universities offer the major teaching Chinese as a second language. So I reached out to the director of uh, the university and students uh, from this major, they have great passion uh, in participating in this um, WeChat um, partner uh, project because they really want to know how foreign students to learn Chinese, what's their uh, learning process. Uh, so um, they, they, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not that hard to find, but one thing is before we start the project, uh, uh, I give them a few uh, training workshop. I introduce that stu the Chinese students some basic information of of our course, the, the student's background, their proficiency uh, level, uh, make them get familiar with um, what's the course like at MIT. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm checking the time. And so now I'm going to um, try to, to also prioritize the questions a little bit about um, some themes that maybe we haven't touched upon as, as much. Um, so there is a question about, um, and I'm going to direct this to any panelists who encourages students to have videos, video on at all times. How, how do you um, approach this in your class? I think this is always a big question. Um, there's a lot of discussion about um, what are some of the strategies that you have used to encourage students to have video on at all times? So if um, one of the panelists would like to go first, if you want to just, you can just raise your physical hand and I can call on you. Ari, Ari, and then if Simona wants to add on. Oh, Simona should go first because my answer is really easy. <laughs> well, I, do not, I do not have a complicated answer either. Um, 
I feel really weird about this whole thing of asking people to uh, uh, open their video because of the different circumstances in which everybody is. And because I know that sometimes when I'm meeting at 8 a.m., I am in my PJs, I don't want to have my video on. Uh, I'm a late riser, I have to admit. Uh, I think that the best way that we found is that we told them some of their, the, the, the students care about their grades. That's the bottom line here, a lot of them. And so we added a participation, little 5% to their, to their class. And we said that we care about the fact that they are not just there uh, with their picture on, but they engage and they ask questions. And in the beginning, I think this was a motivator to get them to engage. And, um, and then it became a little less of a barrier. There are still people that always have only their picture on, but in general, I think in the beginning, giving this extra motivation work, and also because when we do the discovery lab, these are physical things that they interact with, they need to, so in the beginning, what I did is I sent a big survey uh, in August uh, when I was preparing the kids. And in this survey, I asked all kinds of questions. Uh, do you have a, uh, well, the addresses, of course, but then also, are you okay sharing your, having your video on? And are you, what, do you have a tablet? Do you have all kinds of things to figure out how the, the collaboration would work? But one of the questions was, would you be okay on average to have your video on and, or maybe on some special occasion or on occasion with warning you ahead of time? So we normally have at least in each group one or two students that are willing to have their video on because those are the students that share the, the camera on what experiments we are doing. So we have a whole database uh, based on which we create a group so that in every group I have one or two students that told me ahead of time that they're comfortable having their video on. But that's it. In our case, we've, uh, you know, we have sort of set it as a norm and encourage students to have their video on. But honestly, mostly what works for us in that is a lot of the class is students working with other students and whatever works for them in their groups, you know, they're very, um, they're very accepting of one another. So if someone's got their video off for some reason and is still actively, actively participating, other students don't hold it against them. Uh, but because of that, there tends to be much more students wanting to have their videos on, wanting to see one another, wanting to be visible. And I think that carries over into the larger class sessions. Uh, but it's fine if, you know, if, if we saw all the videos off, we'd have to deal with that in some way, but it has not been a problem for us just because of the nature of the class, yeah. Thank you, Ari. So King, I have a, another question for you. Um, do you encourage students to gather outside of class for homework, discussion, to practice language skills? And, and do you or your core staff do anything to help facilitate that? Um, I think it does, it's very important to offer um, multiple channels for students to communicate um, between teacher and student or among students. So in this course, in the language course, I do not assign specific, specific time for them to mingle. But as I mentioned in, uh, in my presentation, I offer the, like the Chinese table and I use the Padlet as a platform, the primary platform for them to, to communicate. And also I designed a few um, group projects so they can, they can just you know, uh, find their partner and they collaborate to work, work on the project. So no fixed time for mingle, for, for mingle activities. Um, Thank you. Um, so I know that uh, Molly would, would like to wrap up the session shortly. So I'm, I'm seeing that there's a, um, definitely more questions um, on the Slido. A couple of them I have actually replied to myself because they were clarifying questions. So if you go to the Slido, you'll see that there's a little arrow um, at the bottom of, of, of the questions where I've um, offered a response. And we'll also try to connect with the panelists to get the other questions um, answered. And, and we'll, we'll try to, usually we send a follow-up message with the link to the recording, and we can also include our responses to those questions. Um, Ari says that he does have one like one thing to mention. So Ari, if you could uh, mention it um, in the, in maybe in, the, in a one minute um, um, mention, that would be great. And then Molly will wrap it up from there. 
Sure. So I just want to let you know, our students are doing their big presentation on December 2nd at 7 p.m. Their problem this year is how to deal with um, the local biodiversity crisis. If you want to know more about that, um, you can drop me a note. I'm awe at MIT, or you can write to terrascope at mit.edu. Uh, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, December 4th, I uh, was just Wednesday, December 2nd at 7 p.m. and it'll be online. Great, thanks. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming and especially thank our panelists, Simona Socrate, Kang Zhao and Ari Epstein. And also thank you all for coming and for attending and participating. Um, you know, we're, we're learning how to do this in the best way of doing this. And we would welcome your input and feedback and thoughts about this session or ways to do this that will be benefit you most. So feel free to be in touch with us and we hope to be doing more this year. So anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Stay healthy. Thanks, Molly. It's really important to get together even for us. Yes, it is. Amen. Like, I think the most important thing is share compassion for one another. I think that's the message that's important that we give to our students. And I think they appreciate that. A little bit of flexibility goes a long way, I find. Yes. Amen. Thank you Thank to you the panelists. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks.